All right. Gospel of Mark. Now we saw last week, is he on? He clicks. There it is. We saw last week at the end of chapter 6 that Jesus and his disciples, they'd sailed to Gennesaret on the western uh, side, the western coast of the Sea of Galilee, and there Jesus healed many people. And then in chapter 7, some Pharisees and experts in the law from Jerusalem, they observed that his disciples were eating with unwashed hands, which violated a long-standing oral tradition, which the Pharisees and the scribes, they held to be authoritative. And they asked Jesus to defend the conduct of his disciples. And then in chapter 7, verses 6 through 13, Jesus rebukes them for rejecting God's commandment in order to observe their own traditions. And exhibit A of that practice was how they rejected God's command to honor one's mother and father, which included caring for one's mother's and father's spiritual needs in old age. Well, they they rejected that for the sake of their tradition about Korban which as I explained last week, but this is the idea that if somebody pledged an asset or some of their wealth to God, that they were then precluded, at least in some rabbinic understandings, they were precluded from disposing of any of that wealth to benefit their parents in their old age. So they pitted their, their oral tradition, it became pitted against what God had revealed in his word about honoring one's parents. And in attacking the authority, so he he undermines, he attacks the authority of oral tradition, which they held to be authoritative. He attacks it with regard to Corban. And in doing that, he undermined that tradition as a basis for their objecting to his disciples eating with unwashed hands. And then in 714 to 23, he addresses this larger question of unclean food. This idea of contaminated food, ritually unclean food. And he addresses that in light of the kingdom of God that he's ushering in. Because the kingdom he's bringing has an impact on these kinds of things. And that's where I want to pick back up here in 14 to 23. He says that eating unclean food does not defile a person, but rather one is defiled by evil that flows from one's heart. And that's a change from the Mosaic Law. See, which the Mosaic Law indicates that eating unclean food is defiling. In Leviticus chapter 11, Leviticus chapter 17. Now Jesus can say that only because of who he is and what he's doing. You see, Jesus is bringing in the kingdom of God. And with the new covenant that God establishes in conjunction with the coming of the kingdom that Jesus is bringing in, the Mosaic Covenant is rendered obsolete or not operative. And you see that in a number of texts in the New Testament. And not all of the requirements of that prior superseded covenant, that Mosaic Covenant, not all of those requirements are re-expressed in the New Covenant. On the contrary, as as is made clear throughout the New Testament, the requirements of the Israelite cult, you know, all of their worship procedures, the requirements of the Israelite cult, their ritual purity laws, the food laws, and the things tied to Israel's nationhood. Those things are fulfilled in Christ and in the denationalizing of God's people that results from Christ's work. Indeed, Mark says in in verse 19 that Jesus declared all foods clean. So you see that, that, that change, and you say, well, how can he change things? Because of who he is. You see, he's bringing the kingdom of God, and a new covenant is being established in conjunction with that. So he wants them to see not only is the oral tradition that you're basing this on not authoritative and something that you use to trump the very word of God, but I'm bringing in a kingdom that has profound effects on the old covenant. 
something that will render it obsolete. Now, the things that are re-expressed and even deepened in the new covenant, the ethical requirements of the kingdom, are the kinds of things that Jesus mentions to the disciples in verse 21. Evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and moral foolishness. See, these are relational matters that are rooted in the biblical concept of love, which is the center of Christian ethics. So these things find their fulfillment in Jesus and in the new covenant. They are re-expressed and many times even intensified. And that's how they're to be. So when they come to him and say, justify this, he justifies it all right. He, t he tells them, look, what you're trying to, to hold people to is not authoritative anyway, and you need to understand what I am doing. I'm ushering in something new. Then in chapter 7, verse 24, in 24 to 30, Jesus leaves Galilee, and he heads for the region of Tyre. Or it could be, Mark says, the region of Tyre and Sidon. There's a textual issue whether Mark includes and Sidon there. Now, the city of Tyre, it's in Phoenicia, which is about 35 miles northwest of Galilee on the Mediterranean coast. And Sidon, that city, is about 22 miles north of the city of Tyre. And these two cities oftentimes are mentioned together in ancient literature. And in the centuries after Kings, Kings David and Solomon, so after the 10th century, that region, Phoenicia and Tyre and Siren, Tyre and Sidon, came to symbolize idolatry and paganism. And there was significant animosity in the first century between that region and, the, and Israel. So Jesus, though, he goes up to this area, and it seems he goes there seeking a break from the crowds. Now perhaps he's doing that to devote more time to his disciples. I know that's not the bell. <laughs> I mean, I'm in a time warp sometimes when I'm up here, but not that bad. Now, it seems that, that Jesus goes there. I think he's going there to get a break from the crowds. <clears throat> As I say, maybe to devote more time to teaching the disciples. And that's suggested by the fact he doesn't want people to know where he's staying. You see, that seems that he's looking for some kind of time away, whether it's just to rest or it's specifically to teach the disciples. But his reputation, it makes anonymity impossible. That simply won't happen. A Gentile woman who's an ethnic Phoenician who heard of Jesus' reputation as a healer and who becomes aware of his presence, she falls at his feet begging him to cast out the demon that possessed her little girl. Now, Matthew, in his account, he describes her more generally simply as a Canaanite, which is a more regional description. It's accurate, but it's more general. Mark describes her more specifically as a Syrophoenician. Now, it may be he calls her a Syrophoenician, because that region of Phoenicia was in the Roman governing province, what they called Syria. So he may be saying she's ethnically Phoenician who lives in the Roman governing province of Syria. So in that sense, she's Syro-Phoenician. Or it could be that she was of mixed Syrian and Phoenician ancestry. So she could be ethnically Syro-Phoenician. But in any event, Mark identifies her specifically as Syrophoenician. And so she comes and begs Jesus to cast this demon out that has possessed her little girl. And Jesus tells her to let the children eat first. Let the children be fed first. You see, meaning to let Israel, God's children, to be the first to receive the benefits of his kingdom-bringing ministry. You see, this prioritization is in keeping with the proverb. Now, that's what I suspect this is. I suspect this is a proverb. She begs him, and he said to her, Let the children be fed first, 
the children of Israel to be the first to benefit from his kingdom bringing ministry and then he cites what I take as a proverb I'm not alone in thinking it's a proverb but he says for it's not right to take the children's bread and to throw it to the little dogs that's a diminutive form of dogs it's not these huge snarling dogs it's to the little dogs and so the meaning of this proverb I take it this proverb simply means that look first things first you know let's keep priorities straight so he tells her let the children eat first there is a priority in this to the Jew first and then to the Gentile so there, so in in keeping with that prioritization he cites this proverb the meaning of which is simply look first things first you see so it, this idea when he says it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs that is to place the secondary feeding dogs ahead of the primary feeding one's children see if that was indeed a proverb as I think it is well then citing it, it reinforces the point that Jews come first in God's plan and it takes away the personal edge that people always worry about I don't think Jesus is saying to her listen when he says here uh, let the children be fed first it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs you're a dog I think he's citing a proverb you see and that takes the personal edge off it and that proverb simply stands for first things first okay but what does the woman do the woman comes back and she says look she won't be deterred so Jesus is saying okay she wants this miracle performed and Jesus says let the children eat first let the benefits to the Jew from the kingdom coming let them be the first to receive these benefits she's not put off by that she winds up she tells him look she won't be deterred and in that she manifests the kind of determined faith that the Lord has blessed right when the people come and they come through the roof they won't be they won't be barred by the crowds when the woman healed of bleeding she comes through and she fights through and touches him you see that kind of faith that is to the point that I will not be put off by obstacles and so this woman she she shows that same kind of determined faith and then she responds in terms of the proverb and says Lord yet even the little dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs now what a response the implication you see is that is that he is so great and she knows it that he's so great that the exorcism she's requesting is no more than a crumb of the power he possesses and the blessings he brings so she he, he comes back to her he says to the Jew first she won't be deterred she responds in terms of the proverb and says look even the little dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs and Jesus then says to her because of that response because she will not be put off because she knows who he is in terms of this great power at work he tells her she may go and the demon has left her daughter and he accomplishes this simply by willing it he chose for the demon to be gone and the demon was gone and so he tells her that and sure enough she went home and found her daughter lying in bed and no longer possessed by a demon and this episode you see it's another pointer there have been others it's another pointer to the fact the gospel though given first to the Jew they are the root given first to the Jew ultimately will what will embrace all people you see Gentiles will be grafted into the Jewish root and so that's what he's saying first to the Jew but you see here this idea he extends it and he's done things over he's done things over on the eastern coast in the Decapolis and so you see here this idea that though that though it's given first to the Jew ultimately what ultimately is going to be all over 
everyone is going to be uh, having access to this. And then in 731 to 37, Jesus went from the region of Tyre. He goes north to Sidon for an undisclosed region reason. And then he goes from there, he goes over to the Gentile area of the Decapolis on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And his interactions there presumably were with Gentiles. It doesn't specify that, but he's gone over to this Gentile region. And so presumably his interactions there are with Gentiles. Now some people bring to Jesus a deaf and speech impaired man and they beg him to place his hands on the man, which is a way of asking Jesus to heal the man. That's what, they're, that's what they're doing. And it's noteworthy, at least to me, that in all the Bible, when you, have, you look at the Greek translation of the, of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, and in the New Testament, in the entire Bible, this word, speak with difficulty, the word that is used there for speak with difficulty, it appears only there in Mark 7.32 and in Isaiah chapter 35, verse 6, which rabbis interpreted Isaiah 35, 6 as a reference to the Messianic age. So I just thought that's kind of interesting. You get two occurrences, you get it here, and you get it in a text that the rabbis said referred to the Messianic age. But Jesus takes this man aside privately, and he performs a number of actions. He puts his fingers in the man's ears. He spits probably on his finger. He touches the man's tongue. He looks up to heaven. He sighs and he says, be opened. Now since Jesus can heal with a word or he can heal simply by willing it. You see, he can, he can simply will it. We're puzzled by some of the actions he takes in association with this particular healing. I mean, we understand the praying and the sighing as a reflection of his emotional involvement in the prayer. And we understand the command for the ears and the mouth to be open. But why the fingers and the ears? The spitting. The touching of the tongue. Certainly he doesn't need to do any of that. So why is he doing it? And we're not told. <laughs> You know, that's just part of it sometimes. You're reading and you have questions. You say, I would like to know about this. And God says, look, uh, no, that's just really not that significant for you. And yet we wonder about it. What's going on? How do we make sense of it? What's happening? Now, so we speculate. But the touching, the performing, you know, touching the affected organs, it, it, obviously it's symbolizing some kind of healing he's about to perform as does the use of saliva. That seems odd to us, but in the ancient world, saliva was considered as having healing properties. So it functions, you see, as a symbol of healing, as he's touching, as with saliva. So these things are symbolic indications of healing, but why is he doing them? Why is he using this symbolic indication of healing? It's like, you know, similar to the way the, the apostles anointed with oil in conjunction with some of their healings. Why? You see, what is this symbolic function and why is it used in those instances? And we're left to speculate, but perhaps Jesus did it to produce precisely the impact he wanted given that man's or that group's particular expectations about miracle workers. You see, Jesus, he's playing chess in dimensions we can't imagine. So maybe these people have certain expectations about how a miracle worker does something, how he doesn't do something, and Jesus is using and incorporating those expectations and either going against them or conforming to them for a reason he has in creating among those people precisely the reaction that he ultimately wants. Now, does it say that? No, it doesn't say that. But I'm just trying to think through what's behind how he'll do this here. He doesn't do it there. And maybe it's something like that. You know, and that's obviously a complex calculation. Trying to figure out how are these things going to affect given these people's perceptions. Because he's laying groundwork. 
Not only, I think, for the timing of his everything coming to a head that he will die in God's timing, but also I think he's planning ahead for when the church goes out. And what is the message that has been spread? And he's using these different things, I think, uh, in advance of that. So he, he heals the person. Jesus said, be open. The man's able to hear and to speak clearly. And he tells him to tell no one. Okay, knowing, I believe, when he says that, knowing, I believe, the effect that that admonition would have, and again, using that to control the public expectations and perception of him as part of his orchestrating of events. Because he's doing this. Sometimes he'll say, you go do this. Sometimes don't tell anybody. Sometimes do this. he'll tell them not to tell anybody, they'll go tell somebody. Okay, I've talked about this before. That's how I see this larger thing is that Jesus is using these things and these admonitions, knowing their effect as part of his orchestrating of events so that things will turn out just the way he intends for them to turn out. So I think that's what's going on. But he winds up telling them that and he says, look, uh, you know, don't tell them. And then Mark reports that the people are utterly astonished. He says, he has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Now, have you picked up in Mark how often Jesus is doing miracles and healing and casting out demons? You don't get the long stretches like the Sermon on the Mount. What Mark is giving you is the power of Christ invading. And he's healing. And he's doing all of these things, and this is this kingdom bringer. And as I've said, see, this is what will be globally done when the Lord returns. This idea that this power will be used and exercised in that case. And then in chapter 8, verses 1 to 10, we have Jesus feeding the 4,000. Remember, he fed 5,000 men. And now he feeds 4,000, and the phrase that it, in verse 1, it says, in or during those days, it most likely refers to the previously mentioned visit to the Decapolis. Okay, it's not, it, that's not certain, but it seems most likely that's what it's referring to. And if so, then the feeding of the 4,000, it occurs in a, in a Gentile setting, which is how most scholars understand it. And as had happened with the feeding of the 5,000, we're again in a situation where you have a, a large crowd is present in a remote area. This is just what happened with the 5,000. In, in this case, though, Jesus takes the initiative. In the other case, the disciples came. They took the initiative. Here, Jesus takes the initiative, initiative and he summons the disciples. And he explains that he has compassion on the crowd because they've been present for three days that's no doubt as Jesus was teaching. So this crowd's been present for three days and they've exhausted whatever food they were able to bring with them. Three days is a good while. You're bringing three days worth of food. So they brought some food, didn't know how long they'd be out there. And in that period of time that Jesus has been teaching, they've exhausted that food. And so he's concerned that at least some of them will collapse on the journey back to their homes unless they receive some food. You know, these people are walking long ways. You know, it's like I said, well, yeah, this place is 35 miles northwest of here, 22 miles, 25 miles. I'm thinking, you want me to walk 25 miles? I said, man, I walk around the block and I think, I'm Harry's doing it. Harry's back there saying, that's a piece of cake. But I walk a mile around the block and I think it's a big deal. But these people are walking, so he's thinking if they're famished and they've got, you know, 20 miles to go, and particularly with whatever the terrain is that he's concerned about them. Now, even though the disciples already witnessed Jesus feeding 5,000 men with five loaves and two fish, you see in chapter 6, 30 to 44, they say, where in this wilderness can anyone get enough bread to satisfy them? Isn't that interesting? <laughs> where, where in this wilderness could anybody get enough bread to satisfy this crowd? Now, you would hope they'd realize that Jesus, the Messiah, could get enough bread to satisfy them. 
Right? You'd hope they'd understand that. But as Mark noted in chapter 6, verse 52, they didn't understand about the loaves because their hearts were hardened. Meaning they weren't sufficiently open to Jesus as the unique manifestation of God. They hadn't gotten there yet. They weren't open to that. So they didn't really grasp the import of what he did in feeding the 5,000. They still don't get it. They're spiritually dull. And Jesus has the crowd sit on the ground and he takes the available seven loaves, gives thanks, he breaks them. He gives them to the disciples to distribute, which they did. And then he does essentially the same thing with the few fish available. And so much food was provided that about 4,000 people ate their fill and there were seven baskets full of leftovers. And the word that he uses here for baskets, by the way, it's the same word in Acts 9.25 that's used for the basket in which Paul was lowered down the wall of Damascus. We're talking a pretty good-sized basket. And so, as I told you, the leftovers signify the magnitude of provision. And so we have that many people, and they ate so much, they just couldn't eat anymore. And so he didn't leave. He, he covered all appetite completely from just what was available. And so Jesus, he thereafter, he dismissed the crowd... He got in the boat with the disciples and he goes to the region of Dalmanutha. Now this is the only place in ancient literature where Dalmanutha is mentioned. This is it. Goes to the region of Dalmanutha. And we're not sure where it is. Okay, it shouldn't be a surprise, this being the only place it's mentioned. So we're not sure where it is. Now Matthew refers to the destination as the region of of Magadan, but that's not much help because we're not sure where that place is either. Now, presumably, they are related villages, twin villages, if you will, or a village that had a dual name, Magadan Dalmanutha. Now, most scholars would put this on the western side of the Sea of Galilee, but even that's not certain. That's not certain. Richard Balkum, for example, he puts it on the northeast side. And so it's just not clear where this is, where Dalmanutha is. But we have here, in, in fact, the way Balkum does it, he says that, look, Peter's, what he calls his cognitive map of the Sea of Galilee as a fisherman centered around this north point of Bethsaida, he says that from, from really the north and the northwest, that's one side. That's, that's the home side, and everything else is the other side. So see, so he would even be able to include the northeast part. So anyway, we don't really know where this is, but that's where they wind up going. And then in, in, in 8, 11 to 13, the Pharisees, they come and they demand a sign from heaven. Okay, they, the Pharisees challenge Jesus. You see, they're seeking to discredit him. They are all on board with opposing him. The die is cast for them. And they're trying to discredit him. And they seek from him. They come demanding a kind of sign from heaven, meaning a sign from God that will establish irrefutably. That's what we want. We want a showstopper. We want something that will absolutely, positively establish that you are God's agent. That's what we want. Never mind the public healings, the exorcisms, and the other miracles he's performed. See, their demand frames those things as inadequate for the purpose. That's how they're framing it. They say, in essence, look... Provide something beyond all that. Provide something that will be impossible to dispute or rationalize away. Give us the showstopper. That's what we want. But of course, there's no limit 
to what a hard heart will refuse to see. I've had people say this same kind of thing to me. I've had friends of mine say it'd be a lot easier if he came to me or if he did this or he did that. And I'm sure if something like that happened, then you can always raise the bar. I say, well, how do I know it wasn't something I ate? How, how do I know it wasn't, a, you know, acid I took when I was young? Uh, who knows? You see, you, that's, how, that's how this thing is set up. That you're, you're that way. Well, Jesus sighs deeply in his spirit. And I think this, this reflects his distress over his rejection by the Jewish leaders. See, those representatives of the chicks, he longed to gather under his wings. And here they are rejecting, and he asked why this generation, why this generation demands a sign the very generation before which he has manifested unprecedented divine power. And the phrase, this generation, here in this context, it has a pejorative sense. As Strauss says, recalling the sinful generation of the flood, or the grumbling generations of Is generation of the of Israelites in the wilderness. And Jesus tells them emphatically that no such sign will be given. You see, he's not going to pander to their unbelief. Well, give me this. Let me hear you. No, I don't like that one. I want this. If you do this, then I'll believe you. Look, there's ample, ample evidence of who he is. No, 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 no. I'm going to decide. I'm going to call the tune. I'm going to have you come and serve me and do what I want. He says, no. I'm not doing that. So, now the parallel in Matthew 16, 4, he adds, except the sign of Jonah. Okay, now this is consistent with what Mark says, what Mark reports, that no sign would be given, and that the sign of Jonah... That's not the kind of sign they were demanding. See, one that absolutely couldn't be denied. Something that was, look, beyond the showstopper. And what Jesus means by the sign of Jonah is not in that category. Whether you take the sign of Jonah to refer to his resurrection, as in Matthew 12, 40, or to the preaching of repentance, as in Luke eleven twenty nine 29 to 32. See, what Mark says is that Jesus denied emphatically that any sign like that, that any sign like the one they were requesting would be given. And Matthew includes Jesus' reference to a different kind of sign that would be given. See, a sign that, like the others he's given, would support belief, but not compel it. You see, there is going to be nothing that's going to compel belief. God has set this world up so that you are always going to be left with a way to rationalize unbelief. You have ample reason to believe, but he has left it so that if you want not to, he has left you intellectual space to do that. You see, why do you do that? You can check with him. Okay? On that day. But he has called us to choose him within a certain environment that he has presented and he is saying there is ample for you to know who I am and to come to me. But if you choose to reject me, you can go off in your little world and you can get with your buddies and you guys can sit here and rationalize away what you want to rationalize away. Now, wh wherever this region of Magadan Dalmanutha is, it was on the other side of the sea from Bethsaida. But as I said, that could be northeast. You, you can't tell, really, where that is. They cross to the other side, and they end up near Bethsaida. You see that in chapter 8, verse 22. As I said, Balcom's view, the home side is the north and the northwest. Okay, so they wind up over there. And then in 14 to 21... Jesus warns them against the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. The disciples, they forget to bring bread with them. 
when they get in the boat, which leaves them with only one loaf. Like I said, this is probably a pita-sized, about eight inches uh, circle, maybe an inch thick. And so you see, that would only be a really light lunch, maybe an appetizer for one person. So they only come with one loaf. And Jesus, he warns them to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. Now, leaven's a more general term than yeast. And in the, in the ancient world, leaven, it was fermented dough that was kept back from baking and it was then used to ferment the next batch of dough. So I pull some out, hold it, and use it to ferment the next batch of dough. And based on the Passover regulations, you see where leaven was removed, based on the Passover regulations, Leaven often was viewed negatively, not always, but it often was viewed negatively, symbolizing the permeating influence of sin. You see that, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. Now, the leaven that Jesus is warning against, the leaven he's warning against is probably the blindness to his identity and resistance to his kingdom-bringing work that characterized the Pharisees, and Herod. And then right on cue, right on cue, the disciples, they begin arguing among themselves about not having bread. See, no doubt uh, debating which of them had dropped the ball so that when we got in the boat, we didn't have bread. You were supposed to get it. You can just see that, right? Well, who did this? So they're debating about this, and Jesus asked them why they're so concerned over the failure to bring bread when they're with him. Why are they so concerned? Are their hearts hardened and their ears so dull that they fail to recognize who he is and what he's doing? I mean, it is a a mind-blowing thing. But he's with them, teaching them, showing them. And he's wondering, are you that dull? Do you don't remember the miracles he's performed? What are you guys? You feel like grabbing them and slapping them. You know, aren't you paying attention? Are you that dull that you see but nothing registers? You don't connect any dots at all? You just kind of like walk around. Yeah, that was cool. That was cool. You know, instead of understanding what do these things, what do they wind up meaning? And he asked them how many baskets of leftovers there were after he fed the 5,000, the 5,000 men, after he fed the 4,000. They saw him on those occasions provide, see, from small amounts of food, more than a multitude wanted to eat. Right? I mean, more than a multitude wanted to eat, and yet they're upset over having only one loaf. They're all concerned about that. And upset about it. And you can feel his disappointment. And perhaps even his weariness in the question, do you not yet understand? He's out, he's training them, teaching them, showing them, modeling for them. And here they are, just as thick as can be. You say, and he asks them that. They're in danger, see, of being infected with the kind of blindness that had the Pharisees. And that's what he's talking about, this be, be warned about that. You see, there's a battle raging, and you need to be careful about that. Let's see if I can get through this one. I heard that first bell. Now, in, in 822 to 26, in Bethsaida, some people, they, they bring a blind man to Jesus, and they beg him to touch him, which again is a request for him to heal the man, and Jesus leads the man out of town. Again, you see these little things, it's like, what's this? Leads him out of town. Okay, well, that again, that's presumably, you see, he's doing that's part of his managing people's reactions as part of his orchestration of events in keeping with God's will. And he then spits on the man's eyes, puts his hands on his eyes, and as I said earlier, saliva in the... In, first century it was commonly viewed as 
having healing properties. So you can see this as some kind of symbolism that he is using here. So he, 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 and as before, we're not told why he used it in conjunction with the healing but as I say, it presumably it fulfills some kind of symbolic function that Jesus deemed significant for this particular healing, a role that was similar to that anointing with oil that you saw the apostles doing. Now this is the only case where Jesus chooses to heal someone in stages. This is the only place where that happens. He asks if he can see anything. And the man's vision is partially restored to the point where he can see people, but only see them as indistinct vertical objects. That's all he can see. They are indistinct vertical objects, which is why he says they look like trees walking around. He doesn't have a clear picture of them like branches and all this stuff. He simply sees these indistinct vertical things that are walking. And so he says they look like trees walking around. And Jesus touches his eyes again. And then the man's sight is fully restored. And he sees everything clearly. And you say, well, what's up with this? Wouldn't you like a footnote where you're told? Here is why Jesus did that. Okay, in the absence of that, I'm going to speculate for you. Okay, so you understand, I have no clear statement of this, but it seems to me that Jesus intends this healing. Because we know he could just say, you know, healing, right? He's clearly doing this for a purpose. And it seems to me he intends this healing to function as a kind of parable for the disciples' gradual gaining of full spiritual vision. Now he does it in just two stages, but I think those two stages are intended to represent the gradual illumination of the disciples. Peter, as we're going to see in the next scene in Mark, he confesses Jesus' identity as the Messiah, but afterward the disciples, they show a clear lack of spiritual insight when they respond to Jesus' predictions about his death. So they have this illumination. He's the Messiah. But that vision is quite blurry. What does that mean by the Messiah? Because when Jesus winds up and starts to tell them what it means for him to be the Messiah, they don't really compute with that. doesn't fit. You see, so their vision, though there's illumination, is still blurry. And then we'll see it, it will clarify, and it will really become clear after the resurrection. See, that's when things really, whoosh, they clarify. But I think that's what, what is going on here, you see. It's only after his resurrection, I heard that bell. So then Jesus sent the healed man home, and he told him not to go into the town. Now, this presumably, once again, is managing the public reaction to him for a larger purpose, Okay. Now, how about that? Stopped right before 8.27 to 30. That's good. Thanks. Thanks for coming. 